Thank you all for coming, for being here, and thank you for this warm um, introduction. I am delighted to be here and honored to give this year's Rudolf Bernhard Lecture, particularly as part of a broader series of events where we commemorate and celebrate his life and his legacy. Let me start my talk with a citation from Professor Bernhardt in the German Yearbook of International Law that date back to 1999. And I quote, an evolutive treaty interpretation is the adequate and necessary response to the changing character of international law and the intensified cooperation between states. This kind of interpretation requires careful consideration and sometimes restrictive applications but it should be considered an adequate response to modern questions and problems, end quote. And as this quote indicates, working as a judge and later president and vice president of the European Court of Human Rights, Professor Bernhardt consistently advocated for the European Convention on Human Rights to be interpreted dynamically in light of modern questions and problems. The convention, in other words, should be seen and handled as a living instrument. In this lecture, I reflect on modern questions and problems that shape our interpretation of human rights today. As the earth is becoming increasingly inhospitable to life, as Achille Membe puts it, ecological threats posed to life act as prime examples of modern questions and problems. In this lecture, I want to linger with the metaphor of life, of vibrancy, vitality, and open-endedness that sits at the heart of Professor Bernhardt's interpretative canon. To this end, I will focus on the living ecology of the European Convention. If the metaphor of life has played a key role in discussions on how to interpret the Convention, would it be possible and what would it entail for this living Convention to become a Convention for the living? What would it mean, in other words, to analytically shift attention from the living constitution to a constitution of the living. To answer this question, one first has to confront the difficult interrogation of what life is and what forms of life currently merit legal consideration and protection. Or to put it in Judith Butler's terms, what forms of life are grievable and ungrievable in the legal, political, and aesthetic understandings of the protection of life. A differential degree of care is attributed to life among humans, with the life of some more, worth more than others. Think, for example, of the recent allegations by Joseph Borrell about European livings in a garden invaded by Europe's others living in a jungle, thereby inevitably echoing the ungrievable life of the 25,000 migrants and refugees lost to the Mediterranean Sea. But a differential degree of care is also unequally distributed among non-humans with the protection of megafauna and flora of the overground life disproportionately attracting the lion's share of protection. And of course, life is differentially protected between humans and non-humans with the abundance of life drastically declining in the number of insects, vertebrates, and plant species today. Against this background, one way in which the development of international environmental law can be narrated is as a continuous evolution and expansion of the understanding of life and its protection. Today, two main proposals are being advocated to reinforce and extend the protection of light, life in light of existential threats posed by ecological and climatological disorders. One proposal is the recognition of a self-standing human right to a healthy environment which I refer to as the liberal response. As I will argue in the first part of the lecture, this proposal is framed around an anthropocentric understanding of human life and all the environmental conditions that need to be protected in order to sustain, nurture, and safeguard such life. The notion of life that is treasured here is perhaps best visualized in the precarious, innocent, and vulnerable faces of future generations. A particular projection of a specific form of life, or rather way of life, that is worth protecting, lingers in these invocations. Against this instrumental approach to the protection of human life as part of a protected environment, another popular proposal consists in advocating for the protection of non-human's life. 
by recognizing rights of nature. I refer to this proposal as the critical liberal response to ecological threats posed to life. And as I will argue in the second part of this lecture, this proposal grants to so-called nature the protective status of liberal human subjects. These two responses constitute the living differently and enact particular constitutions of the living. When thinking with and against these responses to biological theory, feminist ecology, and decolonial Anthropocene studies, the ideals of the living that these proposals suggest appear as narrow, limited, and restrictive. In contrast, the living that is present in these trends of theory and practice is neither that of human life worth protecting as part of a containing environment, nor that of a liberal expansion of subjectivity to include and incorporate the non-human. Rather, a symbiotic perspective on the constitution of the living emerges where life is co-constituted by and through entangled human and non-human relations. In the third and final part of the lecture, I therefore speculate about how a symbiotic view of life opens up a distinct constitution of the living. My key argument today is that legal thinking in the sphere of human rights and environmental protection might benefit from contemporary perspectives on the living by drawing inspirations from conceptual work on more than human life as advocated in biology, feminist ecological philosophy, and critical black studies. The main question that drives my lecture is how could we think, rethink, expand, and enrich the concept of life that currently receives legal attention. So let me turn to the first part of the lecture on the liberal response to ecological threats posed to life. As is well known, human rights-based approaches to environmental protection have been developed, mainstreamed, and amplified over the decades. The very emergence of modern international environmental law was already marked by debates about whether to recognize and in which terms a human right to a healthy environment. Such a right was formulated as soon as environmental concerns made their appearance or entry into global institutional fora. Principle one of the 1972 Stockholm Declaration on the Human Environment stated indeed, and I quote, that man has the fundamental right to freedom, equality, and adequate conditions of life in an environment of equality that permits a life of dignity and well-being, end quote. If over the past five decades, the human rights to life and to health were increasingly referred to in environmental legislations, and the need to protect the environment to ensure the fulfillment of such rights was also inserted in human rights instruments, with the notable exception of the European Convention on Human Rights, adopted more than 20 years prior to the 1972 Stockholm Conference, it is also well known that despite such formal recognition, a human right to a healthy environment is not justiciable as such, before human rights courts. While particular human rights violation can be invoked when environmental issues directly interfere with them, no one is entitled to claim a right to have the environment protected as such if it does not specifically interfere with their lives. As a result, environmental human rights scholars have ad actively advocated for the recognition of a self-standing human right to a healthy environment. The decades-long efforts to reinforce the linkages between environmental and human rights protection culminated with the recognition on the 8th of October in 2021 by the UN Human Rights Council of a right to a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. And one year later, on the 28th of July 2022, its recognition by the UN General Assembly. The member states of the Council of Europe took action too. On the 29th of September 2021, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe adopted a resolution recommending the creation of a new additional protocol to the European Convention to safeguard a right to a healthy environment. The Parliamentary Assembly stated that, and I quote, such a legal text would finally give the European Court of Human Rights a non-disputable base for rulings concerning human rights violations arising from environment-related adverse impacts on human health dignity, and life, end quote. While progressive in its aspiration to align the European Convention to modern questions and problems, as Professor Bernhard insisted, 
I qualify this response as liberal since the emphasis remains centered on human health, dignity, and life. Many might frown upon the explicit anthropocentric formulation. Even more concerning, in my opinion, since it might be counterintuitive to critique a human right for protecting human health, is that such formulation reinscribes a liberal individualization of ecological concerns, which by their very nature exceed such categorizations. The liberal response is concerned with expanding the scope of judicial protection available to individual human victims in light of ecological disruptions. It is this individualizing tendency of liberal thought that preoccupies me here. What is more, should a human right to a healthy environment be recognized in an additional protocol to the European Convention, then not only would individual applicants need to be directly concerned by the environmental issues at stake, but the latter would also need to reach a certain degree of severity to be considered by the court in the first place. Indeed, the court set a higher threshold of admissibility in cases dealing with environmental matters. In the words of the court, and I quote, a certain minimum level of severity must be established which goes beyond the degree of interference of environmental hazards inherent to life in every modern city, end quote. But what are environmental hazards inherent to life in every modern city? Does it also register the life of informal workers, of invisible livelihoods, of those living in the undercommons? And what counts as living in a modern city when this implies a living from environmental pollution that materializes slowly, gradually, and out of sight, far away and far south from these northern urban centers. For the court, it is clear, and I quote again, mere tenuous connections or remote consequences of environmental harms are not sufficient, end quote. As a result, to be admitted before the court, environmental harms must not only be serious, specific, and imminent, but also tied to individuated human victims. Against this backdrop, many commentators, among whom many affiliated here to the Max Planck in Heidelberg, noted how litigants in climate cases currently pending before the court strategically stretched the victim's status to more than one single individual. The Klima Signorinen case, for instance, was brought by an association representing nearly 200 elderly women, while the Duarte de Agostinho case was brought by six Portuguese children and young adults against 33 states and the EU, and the Greenpeace Nordic case was brought by six young climate activists, among whom two SAMI applicants, and two, um, together with two environmental NGOs. Yet despite efforts to expand the victim statues to groups of applicants whose life is directly affected by specific environmental harms, that the general interest in environmental protection is no valid ground for actual popularis is a matter of law. In all the climate cases pending before the court, the plaintiff had therefore to establish a direct link when invoking their right to live in a healthy environment against insufficient climate mitigation and adaptation measures taken by their states. While it remains to be seen if the cases will be admitted and reach the merit stage, one can already note how the court is seemingly countering its reputation of keeping out of trouble with governance by deferring climate cases to national authorities, as Professor Bashak Charlie observed in her last Rudolf Bernhard lecture delivered in 2020, by now attending to staying with the trouble of climate change, as Donna Haraway puts it. Once and if a self-standing human right to a healthy environment will be recognized by the Council of Europe in an additional protocol to the Convention, around 830 million European citizens might be entitled to claim such a right before their domestic courts and, after exhaustion of domestic remedies, before the European Court. These 830 million European citizens will, however, all need to be individually affected and physiologically concerned with rather than merely concerned about the environmental harms at stake for their case to be admissible. If a recognition of a human right to a healthy environment would offer an important and powerful tool for climate litigants, 
we should nonetheless remain cautious about the limitations that an individualized right necessarily performs, making this response a thoroughly liberal one. In short, with a human right to a healthy environment, the life that is protected is that of atomized individual human victims. Only a human life is here judicially constituted. Against this anthropocentric protection of life forms, another response to ecological threats posed to life has been to diversify and expand the very nature of victims of environmental harms by including non-humans as part of it. Let me therefore turn to the second part of the lecture on the critical liberal response to ecological threats posed to life. The critical liberal response is how I qualify the call of granting rights to nature. This response remains liberal since, like with the recognition of a self-standing human right to a healthy environment, only individualized victims can have their rights protected. Yet this response is also critical since at the core of the movement lies a critique of traditional humanism centered on the human figure to understand the functioning of the world. The critique offers therefore a corrective to the narrow anthropocentric focus on human life. By calling for non-humans to be recognized as victims of ecological harms and bearer of rights, the critical liberal response de-anthropocenters the understanding of the liberal victim by extending it to non-human life forms. In this context, many environmental human rights scholars see in rights of nature a way to salvage the planet from anthropocenic living conditions. By way of illustration, the current UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment, David Boyd, qualified rights of nature, and I quote, as a legal revolution that could save the world, end quote. But which world and of whom is to be saved precisely? Like with the liberal response that materialized after domestic legal system had already recognized the human right to a healthy environment in their internal jurisdictions, the global movement of granting rights to nature is follow has followed suit after already 39 countries recognized rights of nature as of 2022. The vast majority of these countries are situated in Latin America, where rights of nature were first constitutionally recognized. Indeed, in the late 2000s, post-colonial states like Ecuador and Bolivia underwent what Moreno called a plurinational and intercultural reconstitutional process, which enabled a legislative recognition of rights of nature based on ancestral cosmovisions of local indigenous peoples, Afro-descendant and native communities who had been marginalized by the constituent powers. In such countries, rights of nature are therefore deeply entangled with non-modernist, decolonial and resisting native and maroon communities invested in de- and reconstitutionalizing the relationship between humans and non-humans differently to articulate new modes of living in the service of creating different futures. Today, however, it is the former European colonial powers that erased, silenced, and marginalized these modes of inhabiting the earth that appropriate rights of nature and advocate a becoming indigenous as a new governmental imaginary to navigate the Anthropocene. Indeed, whether through litigations on behalf of trees in Belgium, a proposed rights of nature amendment to the constitution in Sweden, a suggested recognition of the River Rhine and the Rigi Mountain as rights bearer entities in Switzerland, a motion on special rights for the Vadensee in the Netherlands, or a legislative recognition of rights of nature in Northern Ireland, all these developments point towards an expansion of the liberal category of the right holders beyond the human, which has given rise to what some scholars like Emily Jones call post-human rights. Let me delve into a concrete example here. On the 22nd of September 2022, Spain became the first European country to formally grant a legal personhood status to the threatened saltwater lagoon of Mar Menor. Ecologists had warned for years that Mar Menor is slowly dying due to the runoff of fertilizers from nearby farms. Some of you might remember the images from August 2021 when millions of dead fish washed upon the shores of the lagoon 
a phenomenon blamed on agricultural pollution. The legal representation and guardianship of the lagoon will now be exercised through an authority that will include representatives of public administrations, members of universities, research and scientific centers, and residents of local municipalities. If the public administration does not fulfill its obligation to conserve, preserve, and restore the lagoon, this authority, as new legal person, would be entitled to demand criminal and administrative action before Spanish tribunals. Could Spanish citizens, via the public authority that represents the interest of Mar Menor, seize the European Court of Human Rights on behalf of the lagoon following exhaustion of domestic remedies? This configuration seems implausible since the direct link discussed earlier would require the applicants to be directly concerned, thereby excluding the rights of the lagoon from the jurisdictional scope of the European Court. In a foreseeable future, however, Spanish citizens might have a chance to seize the Court of Justice of the European Union in case the proposed EU Charter on Fundamental Rights of Nature that was drafted by a group of experts and submitted to the European Economic and Social Committee in December 2020, 2019 gets ultimately adopted. But by aspiring to expand the granting of rights from humans to non-human victims, are we then moving towards a recognition of more than human rights, as argued by some? What would it mean to bear more than human rights, and who would hold such rights? While the conceptualization of more than human concerns has long been explored in science and technology studies, political ecology, and feminist ecological philosophy, work on these themes within legal studies remains marginal. I contend this is so because a more than human perspective is antithetical to the modernist understanding of legal relations between subjects and objects that still organizes and underpins most legal orders today. So let us pose with the notion of the more than human before proceeding forward. The notion of the more than human attends to the agency of non-humans such as plants, animals, technologies, and emphasizes the impossibility of disentangling non-human's agency from human's ability to act. More than human perspective are thereby deeply embedded in post-anthropocentric thinking. Thinking past the centrality of the human subject destabilizes dominant ideas about knowledge, sociality, causality, determinism, and ethics in favor of approaches that are more relational, dynamic, material, hybrid, and performative. A common starting point in more than human literature is therefore that relational and compositional politics with non-humans are required, thereby shifting the narratives from acting for to acting with non-humans. But if the notion of relationality has become prevalent in critical strands of scholarship, a confusion often persists about how entities are related. Let us take the example of the liberal response that calls for self-standing human rights to a healthy environment. Here, the human right is framed as conditional upon a healthy environment. A relation is thereby established between the victim's right and the quality of the environment in which it lives. Such relations of interdependence we're already at the heart of humanist advocations of environmental protection. Think, for example, of the, the German Naturphilosophie. But thinking relationality from a more than human perspective discards the understanding of relations as interconnections and interdependencies, where the entities that relate always pre exist their relation, each with respective agency and autonomy to act on this relation. In this liberal understanding of relations, not only is the agency between the relating entities separated, but a hierarchy between different forms of agency is also established, with human agency on so-called nature always prevailing. In contrast, thinking relationality from a more than human perspective 
foregrounds the entanglement of human and non-human agency. It is this mutually constitutive agency of entities entering into relation that matters here. Karen Barat therefore replaces the notion of interaction with that of intra-action. And it is important to emphasize here that more than human perspective are not about everything being con connected to everything, but about attending to the ongoing process of negotiating power relations between humans and non-humans who produce differences out of and in terms of a changing relationality, as Barad insists. What comes to light then is that we can no longer ground our legal vocabulary on predetermined conditions attributed to pre-existing and fixed entities, whether subjects or objects of law. It is rather the constantly emerging and shifting relations of such entities that constitute them and the world they inhabit. To what extent then are rights of nature aligned with a more than human perspective? On the one hand, recognizing non-humans as bearer of rights grants them greater attention and care. In this sense, rights of nature share with more than human perspective the requirement to decenter the human by dehumanizing rights narratives. On the other hand, however, a more than human perspective would require that the very agency of non-humans is co-constitutive of the legal and political actions at stake. As such, more than human thinking is antithetical to calls to better represent the non-human through its rights, since such aspirations reinscribe the very boundaries between pre-constituted humans acting on behalf of rather than acting with non-humans. Could a constitution of the living, then, aligned with insights on more than human life, be envisaged? This is what I explore in the third and final part of this lecture. I titled this concluding part of my lecture The Constitution of Symbiotic Life. In the previous two parts, we saw how both the liberal response to ecological threats posed to life, that calls to recognize a self-standing human right to a healthy environment, and the critical liberal response that calls on recognizing rights of nature conceptualize the protection of the living of humans and non-humans differently. But what forms of life are being written out of the understanding of the living conceived by the liberal and critical liberal responses? Could a more than human perspective more attuned to a constitution of the living help us reconfigure the notion of the living that underpins the human rights-based approaches to environmental protection, which resulted from interpreting the convention as a living instrument. The doctrine of the living instrument is reminiscent of the US doctrine of the living constitution and of the Canadian living tree doctrine, which all emerge from an understanding of society as a living organism. One thread of this metaphorical lineage traces back to the US in the early 20th century. Five years before his election as president, Woodrow Wilson, who was born and raised in the segregated South by parents who were supporters of boat slavery and the Confederacy, puts this in precise terms when stating that, and I quote, society is a living organism and must obey the laws of life, not of mechanics. End quote. But what does it mean to view society as a living organism that must obey the laws of life, not of mechanics? What are these laws of life that Wilson invokes against the laws of mechanics, which apply to the motion of non-living objects? For living organisms, life is a process, not a substance, an unfolding, not a location. In biology, this process is usually understood as revolving around key functions that define living organisms, such as order, sensitivity or response to stimuli, reproduction, adaptation, development, growth regulation, and energy processing. How then 
do these properties of life which constitute the living speak to the idea of a living constitution? And if society is a living organism, does what surrounds it, its environment, not obey the laws of life, but the laws of mechanics? I might be overwhelming you with questions here, but I believe it is important to reflect on the logic of the living instrument as a logic of mirroring. The life of the law mirroring the living organism of society. And I raise these questions to signal something troubling about who tends to appear in this mirror and how, what it reflects, what it fractures, and what it obscures. In asking these questions, I take my cue from Margaret Davis, who in her recent book, Echo Law, Legality, Life, and the Normativity of Nature, deplores how, and I quote, scientific narratives like philosophy and social theory have often reflected the individualizing tendencies of liberal thought reflected in organism-centric investigations of life, end quote. By organism-centric, Davis refers to those investigations of life that emphasize, and I quote again, the compulsion of the single entity rather than its relational existence and its co-productive capacities and reliances, end quote. What I referred to earlier as entangled agency. By focusing on single organisms instead of their entanglements with the milieu through which they sustain themselves and others, such investigations of life inevitably reinforce individualized understandings of life instead of relational and compositional ones. But as biologists Gilbert Sapp and Tauber have argued, and I quote again, for animals as well as plants, there have never been individuals. End quote. Against a Darwinist understanding of evolution that centers on the survival of the fittest at the expense of its others, what Gilbert Sapp and Teuber invoke as a symbiotic view of life reorients the so-called natural selection towards relationships rather than individuals or genomes. This observation is inspired by biologist Lynn Margulis's work on the symbiogenesis of holobionts, which are an assemblage of a host and the many species living in and around it. As Gilbert Sapp and Tauber conclude, and I quote, what we usually consider to be an individual may be a multi-species group that is under selection, end quote. Also the human, in this sense, is always a composition, a host for bacteria, fungi, and viruses variably attached to and entangled with other species and sites, from the subterranean to the atmospheric. With both Davis and Margulis, in short, we get a picture of the human as a relationally composed and entangled with non-humans, a gathering of the more than human. This appreciation reaches deep into the perception of what is within and around us. As philosopher Emmanuel Ecocha argues, this implies a shift from a situatedness to a point of view to what he calls a point of life, where life forms modify their milieu and are modified by it. The oxygen that animals breathe comes from plants while the CO2 that plants use to produce oxygen through photosynthesis comes from the animal's breeding. Here, a point of life rather than a point of view, which always assumes an external observer, is what entangles uneven abilities of humans and non-humans to breathe in metabolic flows. From a point of life perspective then, the sense of individuality and autonomy of the liberal human subject appears troubling. The question hence should not be how the human depends on non-humans, an imaginary commonly invoked in nar narratives about humans being part of nature, but rather the question should be how humans and non-humans interact in the very constitution of life. Yet it is instead an individualized and organism-centric investigation of life that human rights instruments like the European Convention 
reproduce and the conceptualization of a right to life. To appear before the law requires to constitute the human and the environment as singular subjects and objects of law. The symbolic violence of this appearance, so elegantly pictured in Kafka's famous parable, might, li might, likely might lie precisely in this modernist moment of separating individualization. Let us look at how this plays out with the right to life. The European Convention stipulates that everyone's right to life shall be protected by law. But what are the contours and the boundaries of life that the Convention seeks to safeguard? In terms of personal scope, the right to life is granted to an abstract everyone, which could be interpreted as either a natural or a legal person or subject of law. The Convention does not explicitly qualify such person or subject as necessarily human, and it does also not qualify life as necessarily human life. How then is the ability to live understood by the court? A common definition of life would refer to the period between birth and death as the experience or state of being alive. Life is here conceived as the limited period of time comprised between a start, birth, and an end, death, that is experienced by somebody. Some body, in other words, experiences a state of being alive between birth and death, and it is this ability to live that Article 2 of the Convention protects when qualifying the right to life as safeguarding the physical and mental integrity of human bodies, as well as their private and family life. This focus on bodily integrity must be emphasized here, since no consideration is given to spiritual or cosmological dimensions of life which prevail in animist traditions that reject the life, non-life, binary, and attend to vital forces both before and after the birth and death of a physical body. This vitality offers a different perspective on the contour and the boundaries of the living. As Davis argues, agency does not only lie on the side of the living. Agency is not a property attached to a privileged subject as in the autonomous human, but an effect of relations between entities with varying ontological status. From this perspective, vitality, vibrancy, and agency also animate non-living entities that bear vital forces. Before the law, however, the right to life is reduced to living organisms in disregard of the agency of non-living matter that is vital to sustain life on Earth. What legal arrangements would be needed then to protect the relational processing of life without falling back on metaphorical equivalences of the non-human with the human subject? Can non-humans appear before the law and be admitted to its gate without wearing an anthropomorphized guise? Or as Daniela Gandorfer asks, and I quote, could legal subjectness be determined by the dynamisms of its riverness rather than rivers being included in the exclusive club of legal subjects, end quote. Could we perceive the living not only as environmental elements orbiting around and standing in service of human concerns, be they physical, economic, or aesthetic rights, not only as an extension of legal subjecthood towards natural sites considered to be culturally or ecologically unique or essential, but as a process that is unbounded, continuously unfolding and spread across human and non-human entities, whether living or non-living, that together constitute life. Is it possible to align our legal thinking to these insights from biological theory, feminist posthumanism, and decolonial practices that suggest ways of conceiving living otherwise without relapsing into representational thinking. If such a view offers a better conception of so-called nature than the liberal and the critical liberal responses presented earlier, legal subjectivity, it is clear, struggles with entanglements. Against a relational and dynamic conception of life, 
the right to life as currently conceived under the European Convention individualizes the state of being alive. This inscribes a narrow mode of thinking about what the living is. Indeed, while the Convention grants a right to life to everyone, it actually recognizes such a right to everybody. If a group perspective offers over-affected bodies is not excluded, as illustrated with the high-profile climate cases currently pending before the court, the bodies that matter are those of human victims, as stated earlier. These are not bodies of water. These are also not bodies of air. These are the bodies of, deli of well-delineated, bounded, and individuated humans. The right to life, in other words, must be ensured by preventing any human being from having its life deprived and from being subjected to torture or to inhuman and degrading treatment, as articulated in Articles 2 and 3 of the Convention. And as specified by the Council of Europe, and I quote, an inhuman treatment must reach a minimum level of severity and cause either actual body harm or intense mental suffering, end quote. Could exposures to toxicity then register before the law as inhuman acts of torture causing very serious and cruel suffering? Whether we speak about the toxicity of pesticides, heavy metals, or other poisons that get entangled with the reproductive and regenerative forces of both humans and non-humans bodies, or the toxicity of the suffocating total climate of anti-blackness that capitalist slavery suffused as present day environment in an afterlife called the weather, as black studies and feminist scholar Christina Sharp puts it. Here, the treatment of non-humans is as inhuman as the ones reserved to human beings considered less than or sub-humans. Where these questions on the overlap of the human, the non-human, and the inhuman evoke is that while the life of humans is put at the center of the European Convention on Human Rights, in juxta or contra position to what this liberal understanding of human life is constructed and qualified, always remains elusive. So to conclude, and as Professor Bernhard reckoned in 1999 already, and I quote, sometimes old problems need new answers or at least new considerations. In this lecture, I argue that a more than human, relational, or symbiotic view of life opens up new answers, or at least new considerations, to the old problem of how the European Convention addresses ecological issues that are deeply entangled with the living conditions of both human and non-human life forms. While the doctrine of the living instrument that Professor Bernhard advocated for has become a main tool of interpretation of the convention, the living appears only narrowly before the law. New legal arrangements, imaginaries, and vocabularies are needed to think of ecological care beyond the disciplinary limits of human rights law and its enclosure of thought. The enclosure of thinking life only through a prism of liberal, individualist, and subjective rights. The study of the convention and its interpretation as a living instrument calls for a need to make visible the properties of life that evade and exceed rights formulations and to call out entrenched forms of erasures of a living otherwise in how the court thinks and produces the human, the non-human, and the inhuman. I do not have an answer to the question of how to legally protect a more than human living. Thinking legal relations through such prisms will lead us towards a very different legality than the foundations of modern law we are familiar with and on which the edifice of the European Convention was built. My hope today was to bring to life different ways of constituting the living by shedding light on what is erased from our current understanding of the protection of life and to invite us to take seriously the potentialities but also the difficulties of any form of living law. The need for transformation is profound and radical, and mere correctives to the current edifice of modern law 
might be reinforcing the protection of humans and their environment without reconfiguring a need to care for the living differently. This might be tactical today, but impede upon the need to deconstruct the foundations of our current way of living and reconstitutionalize them otherwise. The modernist world upon which our legal categories are grafted is and will always be destructive towards more than human life. Do we then need to stick to ontologies of separation, of supremacy, of hierarchy, to salvage modern law and practice? Or, even if the horizons remains fuzzy, should we think beyond and against the liberal structures of modern law to open up, as Professor Bernhard suggested, new answers to, or at least new considerations, about ecological threats posed to life. Thank you very much for your attention.